All right, so we have two things I want to do today. One is show you how to take the arm from Maya into Keyshot, and then the other one was I'm going to show you how to do the airbrushing um, of the 3D model stuff. Um, so to go from Maya to Keyshot, the first thing that we do is we have to clean up the scene and get it ready. So Keyshot will allow you to assign materials to stuff, but it makes it a lot easier if um, you go through and organize it inside Maya first. So basically, um, looking at any uh, robotic stuff, robotic arm CG. If you look at them, there are very limited uh, selection of colors. Um, even on like this one, it's basically like this gray, black color, orange, um, and then maybe like some little accenty white colors there. Uh, on this one, same thing, you have like red, black, um, some bluish highlights, uh, maybe some yellow areas, okay? So you want to organize all your pieces into what materials or what stuff will be on each one of them. So the first thing I'm going to do is go through, and typically like if you look at them, the, um, like in this case they have the red. So that red metal color is all in the outside and black is on the inside. And then they'll have these accent pieces like this, just kind of randomly, not random, but some sort of order to it, but throughout. Um, so I'm going to go here and just grab things that I think would be metal. So like this is metal, this is metal, this is metal. These two pieces would definitely be metal. This would be metal. These two would be metal. Okay. And I'll add more to this grouping. Uh, and then I'm going to group it all together. Uh, as a texture person, typically as you group stuff, um, it's not always going to be in order of what would be animated because you're a modeler and you're texturing things. So you would typically group stuff together that has the same texture just so it's a lot easier for you to manipulate. So I'm going to call this one uh, metal group. Okay, so this is all my metal stuff. And then I'm going to go and make a layer with this called metal layer. And then I'm going to hide it. Okay, so this metal group is on a layer um, hidden away. So now I can basically start chipping away at this and see what pieces should be metal or a uh, different material and then just start adding them to this group. So I know like this spring, uh, that wouldn't be like a black uh, or a solid color. So that one will definitely be in my metal. I have some nuts and bolts here. I'll add some other stuff down there. I'll add and some stuff over here. So I'm just going through and just grabbing all the pieces that I think would be metal. I'm going to control click my metal group and then just hit P to parent it. And that will drop those pieces into that metal group, which then puts them on the layer, which then hides them. So then uh, let's say that I have some stuff that I want um, colored black. So I know these things I want colored black. There's also these. I think I have some bands on this side as well. Yep, right there. So I'm going to group all those pieces together. This will be my black group. And I'm calling them this. When I get in Keyshot, I can color them whatever I want. Make a new layer. Uh, black layer. Hide that. And then you'll see very easily, it's like, OK, well, what about these? What do I want to put those as part of the metal layer, part of the black layer? Probably the metal. So I'll paste it in, or I'll parent it into that group. Uh, maybe these rings here and here. Maybe those will be in the black group. Uh, this, this. I'll put that in my metal group. Okay, so you just go through that whole thing. As many different materials or textures or colors you want, um, you would just put them into the appropriate group for that. This one's going to be part of the black group. If I have something like my accent colors, like these bands here are a good, they're already combined as one, uh, so it works out good. Uh, I'm just going to group that, and this will be my accent group. And then I'll make an accent layer. Label it correctly, there we go. And then hide that, okay? So what you're going to do is eventually you'll go through all the stuff you have there. It'll be in some sort of group somewhere, and it'll all be hidden. By the time you're done, everything will be organized. You'll be left with a bunch of random stuff just kind of sitting there. That's stuff that maybe you made and duplicated and hid 
like me, you can see all this random stuff that I have that's just like groups, 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 and all empty. Here's some lights in there I don't need, some other stuff I don't need. Uh, I'm going to delete all my history. So I delete all by type history, and then I delete those other things. So by the time I'm actually done with this, this is what my file is going to look like. It'll be nice and clean. And I always save as so I don't accidentally delete something that maybe I needed. Um, I have three groups, metal, black, and accent. And I have three layers. And if I wanted to, um, I can color the layers just so I can get an idea of what is assigned to what. So I'm just grabbing each one of these, giving them a random color, going into wireframe mode, and now I can see that's what my different colors are going to be. Okay? Uh, not colors, but just different pieces. All right, so I'm going to open up Keyshop. <clears throat> We're on version 7 here. They did release version 8. It has some really cool features with it. Um, so if you get a chance, play with it. It definitely is a cool software. Um, typically, before I go between any software, I like to see what file types it takes. So I'm going to go into my import options for Keyshot and go over to this list. Um, at one point, it was very limited as to what Keyshot would take in. Uh, but we should see inside here that it does actually take Maya files directly and it takes uh, Cinema 4D files somewhere in this list. Come on. Way at the bottom. Yep, there it is, C4D. Yep. Um, it also takes STLs, so those 3D printed things that takes those kinds of files, OBJs, uh, the things we would take into um, Unreal or Substance, uh, SketchUp, and so on. Okay, so it does take Maya files, so cool. So I shouldn't need to do anything special here except for make sure it's saved as a Maya file. Then in Cinema, or in uh, Keyshot, I'm going to go to my P drive, go to my 20 folder, and MechArm, and find that. Okay, uh, this window will always pop up basically, do you want to center the geometry, snap it to the ground, do you want to keep it in its original location? Uh, if you had multiple parts that you might be bringing in separately, you would keep them in their original location. That's something you would typically want to do. Um, adjust the camera to look at the geometry, adjust environment to fit the geometry. These are typically default things I always keep on. Um, separate materials by part, that we want to do that. Uh, assign materials from library, we can do that too. Let's see, under geometry, there's nothing there we need. Under animation, there's nothing there, okay? Um, you can bring in animation from Maya, so I could actually animate a camera in Maya and then send that into Keyshot with it. Um, I just have to make sure that I bake the animation of the keyframes. Um, cool, everything should be good. So I'm gonna hit import. All right, so this part might take a few minutes depending on how much geometry we have. Some things we want to look out for. Um, let me turn my wireframe back or my shading back on. Uh, if one of my pieces, if I hit one on this, you can see it's very blocky. <clears throat> when I go into Keyshot, I want to verify that that is not blocky like that because I don't want to go through all this process of building all the textures and making it look perfect, getting my camera set up, and then it turns out that I have a piece like this when I really want it to look like that. Okay, so. Um, did not appear to contain 3D geometry. Yes, you did. All right. Let's try that one again. It's worked before. Uh, let's save it as an MB file this time. We'll try that. And then we will import. And we'll find the MB file. Import. Now, let's pretend that this doesn't come in, because it's very possible that it won't. It looks like it's working this time. Um, if I were to export this as an OBJ, the OBJ doesn't save any of my material information. So any of my um, materials or um, layers, if I assign materials to it, those wouldn't come in. Uh, but in here, as an FBX or a Maya file, they should come in. Now, um, oops. the controls for this is not the Alt key. I keep hitting it. You just click and drag, and it tumbles around. Middle click moves it around, and then right, uh, I'm sorry, not right click, um, scroll wheel zooms in and out. It takes me a second to get used to the programs as I jump between them. Um, so this keeps everything organized the way it was. You'll see over here there's a metal, black, and accent um, folder, just like I had here, metal, black, and accent. If I were to have assigned materials to faces inside of Maya, 
it would remember that information. And as I dropped a material on there, it would automatically pick up any other instance of that material anywhere else. So if I were to have gone into, let's say this, and I grabbed these faces here and I assigned a material to those faces, Keyshot would remember that materials assigned there and I could assign a separate material just to those faces. <clears throat> Inside here, I can't do that if I haven't done it in Maya, okay? So I'm gonna verify, I'm just gonna kinda look through the model and make sure that everything is nice and smooth the way I want it. You'll see that this is nice and smooth. At one point in Keyshot's history, that didn't always come over. Uh, we would actually have to go through and actually smooth it out before it would translate in there. So I'm just kind of zipping around, verifying that everything is uh, the way that I want it to be. Cool, everything looks nice and smooth. All right. Now if it wasn't nice and smooth, I would jump back to Maya, <coughs> grab all my stuff, hit three, it would smooth it all out, or all the stuff I wanted to be smooth, hit three, it would smooth it out. I would save it and then re-import it into Keyshot again, okay, before I go any further. Uh, all right, so now that I have everything laid out, um, I'm gonna just drop some base materials on here and then just get the lighting set up after that. So uh, my metal, I'm gonna go to the metal section in Keyshot. I'm gonna find a kind of metal that I want. Um, it's, pr it's pretty simple. Just go through and like, okay, what kind of aluminum do I want on this? Uh, or anodized st steel. That's kind of cool, right? Um, I actually want the outside to be like a dark um, material. So maybe old, uh, dark and scratches. No, I think nickel might be a good one. And then I'll just adjust that color after. Okay. So I'm going to take this uh, brushed nickel and I'm going to drag it all the way onto metal. And Keyshot will just assign it to anything that is inside that group just automatically. And then I want a black material. I could just type up here, like if I know I wanted this to be a rubber material, just drop the black rubber material on that. And then if I wanted um, an accent color, let's say I wanted something that's more like glassy, I could just type glass and I'll just search through like all of these different materials here and I could find exactly, you know, which one I want. Even if it's not the color I want, I can change it after, okay? So I'm gonna just pick this blue and drop that onto my accent. Okay, so now there's my hand and I can kind of look at it and see, you know, what my liking how it's turning out so far. Uh, do I want to adjust anything? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, I don't like that, this glass. I think I need to have something that's a little bit more, uh, I don't know, vibrant maybe, um, like molded plastic or car paint or something. Like this, I think that might be cool. So let me take this yellow here and I'll drop that onto my accent color. Yeah, that could look kind of cool. Um, I also don't like the um, metal on there. I think I'm gonna go with the car paint. Um, <laughs> Oops. I don't want that blue one though. So I'm gonna keep it pretty standard, silver. Uh, metal, yeah, I like that. Okay. Um, why is my screen like cut off here? There it goes. If I double click any of these pieces, it'll bring up the material here and then I can adjust it. Um, you'll notice that in this one, um, there is no like specific like color area and they have this color tweaker. That's a, again, a new thing to um, this version of Keyshot. Um, so let's say near specular and it's pretty like just try stuff. So let's go to 10. So I give it kind of like an orangey look. Let's go zero, zero, zero here. Let's see what that's gonna do. That gives it kind of a bluey look. Yeah, I'm not liking any of those specific things there. Uh, maybe I can take my refractive index down or up. That's kind of something I like. Okay. I'm roughing it some. All right, I can always play with this after too. All right, um, so the way that it's set up right now, all of our lighting is coming from an HDR. So that's what's lighting this entire scene. There's also a ground plane. Um, all of my environments are right here. If I go to environment, I can choose a different one of these. Based on which one I choose, we'll give this a completely different look. 
So by default, it's on this startup one right here. Um, if I do a um, startup contrasty one, that'll change the look of that. If I choose stripes, it'll change the look of that. And same thing there. So depending on what you have in your scene, it could totally change the look of your entire rendering based on which HDR you've chosen. So go through them and find one that matches the kind of look that you're going for. Okay. And they're pretty quick. Like you can see how quickly I'm just able to drag and drop this and change what that's looking like. Now as I do this, I'm not looking at the background. I'm just looking at my geometry. Okay. Um, the way that this background is being placed, obviously I have this ugly line coming down the middle here. I don't want that. I'm going to get rid of that. Uh, but I do like the shading that's on this one. Um, I may want to crisp it up. Maybe this black is a little bit too flat and maybe this yellow is not shiny enough. So I can tweak that. Uh, but I'm going to go to my environment here um, and tweak it. So this area is your library. So all the stuff that you have, basically you can drop onto things is right here. Um, everything that's already inside the scene is right over there. So my scene is here with all my pieces of geometry. My materials are there. My environment is here. This is again a new thing in Keyshot 7 is we're allowed to actually go through or able to actually go through and edit what that HDR looks like. Uh, there used to be a tool called HDR Shop or HDR Light Studio like this where you would build an HDR and then you'd be able to drop it in. Now it's all embedded. So if I go to my editor here, I can click on one of these pins and scroll down and I can change the radius of that light which will then adjust what that is looking like. And same thing here, I can take this one, which is um, the black color, and I can change the size of it. Same thing here. And as you look at this kind of stuff, I don't know why that's open, wrong one. Um, you can see from some of these images, like just looking at this, uh, where's the light? You can see the light's kind of hitting it mostly from this side. This side is pretty dark. So we basically have a light hitting from the other side. The background is basically just a gradient, so don't pay attention to what that's looking like. Um, it's actually, it seems like it may be coming from the front, a little bit on the left side, okay? So if we wanted to, we can right click on these and delete them. So if we don't like one of these in the scene, we can delete those. We can move these around. So we're adjusting where our lighting is coming from. I'm going to double click this. I just want this roughness to be down a bit. There we go. And the same thing on my black. I think I just need to take that roughness down and that refractive up a little bit. And the same thing on that yellow. Let's take the uh, refractive up some. You can see from the little sample here what it's going to look like too. It'll give you an idea. Here it is at no refraction. And then as I crank it up, what that does. Okay. Uh, back to my environment. Um, all right, so that's looking good. I'm going to go to my camera, uh, and on here I can specify uh, what I want my ground to look like. Nope, not my ground. Nope, sorry, I was in the wrong spot. Under environment, there it is. Uh, I'm going to go to, instead of the lighting environment, I'm going to choose a color and just choose black for my background color. And I'm just kind of positioning this so I can see more of it. Um, I think I may want these yellow things to glow a little bit. So I'm going to double click it. And instead of this being paint, um, you'll see down in the list, there are some ones that are kind of like lighting up or... Um, uh, bright one. So down here, maybe I'll go 0.50 or emissive. There we go. So I'll set that to emissive. I'll go under my color here. Maybe not. Yeah, I think it's too much, too many items.
Yeah, that liquid one looks cool. Even though it's obviously not liquid. I mean, that looks neat. Make this refractive index down a bit. Maybe up a bit. I want that to be a bit brighter. Maybe I'll have to go into here and brighten it up. There we go. Cool. I like that. Um, all right. So I like that black background. I'm going to go back to my image. Um, I can adjust things like gamma. So if I needed to adjust maybe the overall color, um, I can adjust some basic stuff here. I can also go to effects and add a vignette to this. It's a little bit harder to see because the background is already black. Uh, maybe I'll give it a different color. Um, eyedropper, I'm going to grab this red. Take that down slightly. And that looks cool. It's very subtle, which is probably why I wanted something like that. Cool. Now let's pretend that there's an item that we didn't like the color of it. Um, let's say that these little clamps here, I wanted those to be uh, metal. Uh, I can go through my materials here. Uh, if I drag let me double click it just to verify which one's on it. Oh, yeah. So that one is wrong. That's uh, This one is coming up with the glass when it should be that same black rubber. So I'm going to drag this onto that, but you'll notice that it um, is overriding all of them. Because all those things have the same material on it, it assumes that I, that's what I want to do. So if I double click this, go to my scene, there's that item. I can right click and set inside here, material, unlink material. And so what that does allows that material to have its own uh, item on there. So now when I drag the rubber onto it, now that one's all by itself. Okay. Uh, the other thing that will play a role in what your stuff looks like is obviously the angle. So if we're over here, you can see it looks very dark, <coughs> uh, but as we get to this side, it's a lot brighter. As we get to this side, it's even more brighter, okay? So just be aware that the angle that you're choosing on this uh, will also play a role. Okay, um, cool, so there's my scenes set up. I don't need to do anything there. You can move stuff around in here. It's not very intuitive. Um, let's say I wanna grab my whole model, which is right there. I go to position. It brings up a move tool if you click this. And I can move it and rotate it and scale it, but it's just not as easy to do as other programs like in Maya or whatever, especially for scaling things. Um, probably better off just scaling it like so if you need to. Okay, um, you can also snap it to the ground if you see it. Um, I do want a little bit more pop in this. Let me uh, hit done here. I do want this to maybe like be a little bit more something in the scene. Uh, I'm going to add a ground plane. So under edit, add geometry, I'm going to say uh, ground plane. There it is. There's my ground plane. I'm going to go to my materials and I'm going to choose just a basic aluminum to drop on there. Okay. Uh, so there's my ground. Go to double click it. Let's go to roughness. I'm going to make that a bit rougher. Now, I don't like how I can see that edge back there. It's just part of how it works. Um, if I click on it, maybe I can go to that item and scale it up even more. It didn't go all the way, but it went obviously a bit further. Um, let's say that I want that to kind of fade out into the distance. Uh, I can go to the material for it, go to textures, and on opacity, I can right click and add a different material. So the one I'm going to use is color gradient. And right now, this is going from this color, which is totally opaque, to this color, which is totally transparent. 
if I change this to spherical, let me rotate up so I can see this better. If I do planar, come on. Oh, I'm too far out. Or that's too big. Still that big? Here it comes. There it is. All right. So if we look at this, now this side is transparent. This side is opaque. I'm going to change this to spherical, and now I get this nice, nice little round area. And so now I can take that and scale it up. And so now as I spin around and look at this, I'm not going to see that weird edge. I'm going to see a nice rounded edge all the way around it. Okay, so I won't have that hard edge there. And now I can maybe play with this roughness a little bit to get that. If I wanted the arm to be laying down more, I could grab the arm at this point and then maybe click on that move tool, rotate it slightly, move it down slightly. Like I said, you want to be kind of delicate with this because it's not a perfect tool. And then we have to hit done every time. It's kind of weird. There we go. Okay. So now this gives us basically like this is sheet metal. Um, let's say that we want this to look more like um, glass or something. Or not glass, but like water. Like this is a puddle. Instead of doing the roughness here where I'm just overall adjusting it, um, anywhere you see that little... Um, bar or box like this, just like Maya's, uh, we can click on it and add a material. So I'm going to add to this, I'm going to add a brushed texture. And I'm going to play with, I'm going to unlink these. And just adjust this some. And maybe play with the angle. Like that. And what this does is it just gives the roughness, instead of it being very um, soft, it gives it a lot more, uh, or overall it gives it very, um, uh, here it's rough and here it's not. Uh, I'm going to take maybe the bump height up some. Maybe take the contrast up some. And maybe take the entire scale of this up some. Okay, so you can create a lot of different looks to these kinds of things, especially when you look at, uh, this one doesn't have it, but some of these will have that kind of reflection in the ground, like that one where you may want something different happening there. There we go. So I'm not really liking the way that's turning out, so I'm just going to hit this back button. Where's my roughness? There it is. I'm going to right click and just say delete. Now it goes back to where it was and then pull that up. Okay. So I'm fine with that. Maybe I'll take the color for this and just darken it some. Yeah, I like that. Cool. Um, awesome. All right. So now let's set up a camera in here. Uh, Keyshot has this weird thing about how it sets up image size. So if you set this, like we want to render this at 960 by 540 for a, um, for a still image, you'll see that even though I'm typing in 960, that it's not updating that value. Uh, it does this thing where it only lets you size the screen to as big as your screen is. So my screen resolution isn't, it doesn't go up to 960, so it doesn't let me do that. If I start closing windows, um, it'll let me adjust some of those properties, but it'll never get me exactly where I want to be with this. So you have to do this like weird uh, project. I mean, there we go. You have to do this weird thing where um, you unlock it like this, then type in 960 by 540. Now it lets me resize it. Then I lock it, or yeah, there it is, locked, and then link it, and then I double click. And now it's registering at 960 by 540. 
even though it's not, okay? Um, now we can't see this, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to unlock it. Because it's linked, it'll automatically fit it into screen, because I need to see what the whole screen's going to look like, okay? As long as they're linked, proportions are still the same, I'm happy. All right, so now let's do a little camera animation on this. Um, did you adjust? You did adjust. I didn't tell you to adjust. Give me a second. Okay, click the line. How's that look? Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I don't know how it adjusted a second ago, but now it's back. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to add a camera to this. And under my scene, here's my new camera. So I'm going to rename it. Okay, so we want for this turn in, we're gonna do a camera animation, and then we're gonna do a still image. The animation will be, um, did I specify a size for that? Uh, three seconds, there we go. So three seconds of animation, and then um, one still image. So I'm gonna go to the camera here. There's a bunch of animation stuff under the camera. Sorry, not the camera. Under the stuff here where it says, like the cameras, no, no, no. Oh, right click, there it is. Um, let's see, orbit, panoramic, uh, what do we wanna do? That's not it, okay. So I'm gonna go to the animation menu. This brings up a timeline. Uh, I'm gonna click animation wizard and it basically says, choose which parts, which type of animation you wanna do. Um, a camera animation or an, a part animation. So on this one, you could do like pieces moving, a turntable, whatever, that kind of stuff up there. Uh, or you could do the camera animation, this kind of stuff. So let's do, um, let's do a translation. Okay, a little preview about what it's doing. That's what I want it to do, but I'm gonna go left and right, so that's fine. Uh, camera movement, that's the one I want to use. And then which direction do I want to go? So basically, the way it sets up is like, you're starting wherever you start, and then it's gonna move over that much. So right now it's set up to go in the Y direction, one unit. And then it's set to linear, which is perfect, because we don't want easy in, ease in or ease out or any of that. So I'm gonna say finish, and then just see what happens. So there's our current animation. We want this to be three seconds, so we'll Scrub this down to three seconds. Now our animation is three seconds, okay? Now that's not the direction I wanna go. Let me get a bit closer here, like that, okay? Um, my screen is like incredibly squished, so I'm gonna pull this thing out, okay? So basically our starting point is wherever my camera is currently at, and it's gonna go one unit up. So I don't want it to go one unit up, so I'm gonna say zero, and then I'm gonna say, okay, for the X direction, let's go, let me go to the end of this animation here. Um, I'm gonna pull this over this way, so maybe we'll go negative five or negative 20, there we go. And then let's go into it. Yep, so that's gonna go that way, so negative 50. Okay, that's too close in, so let's go negative 25. It's kind of silly, but that's just how it works. All right, so now if I look at my animation, this is what we have. Okay, so maybe a little bit further back, let's go negative 45. Okay, cool. And now I believe I can mirror this. Uh, and now this will go backwards. So I can say, maybe I wanna go the other way. So I'm gonna delete this first one. Close that. And then just scoot this down here. And what's neat about this is that once you have these things kind of set up, you can really use it for a lot of different uh, types of things. Oops, let me get closer to it. Again, it's using my starting point as where it starts from. So I'm gonna start here and then back out to there. Let's go a little further over. There we go. So that seems to fit pretty good. Cool. Uh, so now I'm gonna go through and render it out. 
Um, you can do things, just so you're aware, inside here, like, not that, not that, not that. There it is. Um, depth of field. So if you want a depth of field, just so you're aware of it, I can click depth of field. I can say select focal point, click on a piece of geometry here, and then adjust my f-stop. And then it'll refine it, and eventually you'll get to that spot. Apparently it's not picking a good spot. It's like way off. Or maybe I just need to crank that up even more. a little bit fuzzy. Uh, but as I come back here, you'll see that it pretty much maintains that same uh, area. You may have to adjust it some, but it should be pretty good because it's basically locking into uh, where that point is. There you go. Um, but I wouldn't recommend animating with that. Just, just wanted you to be aware of that uh, feature. All right, so now I'm going to go to my lighting. I'm going to set this to uh, product because that's what this is. Um, product, all of these things here, just set these other options. So on performance mode, you'll see that all these are off. We don't get any of those. If I turn on self shadows, turn on global illumination, turn on ground illumination, that's what those are turning on when we go to product. There you go. I'm going to go to render and say render here. Under animation, I'm going to specify a size. So 960, uh, because we're locked in the proportions, it automatically sets it to 960 by 540. I want the entire duration, which is three seconds. I don't want a video, I want frames. That way in case it crashes, I don't lose everything. I'll put this inside my images folder and I will call this Zarcona MacArm dot pound, 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 uh, .exr, okay? Um, if you wanted to do depth of field after the fact, um, this is where you could specify, I want the depth to render out. I want a uh, clown render. <clears throat> uh, maybe I want my diffuse, my lighting, global illumination, caustic. We have no caustic sense. Uh, reflection, refraction, shadows, ambient occlusion. I mean, normals in this case, your labels. Uh, the clown pass, let me render out one frame and then you can see what that looks like. So frame range, one to one. And then we'll say render in background, oops, sorry, options. Um, set your samples, the higher the samples, the smoother it's gonna be, but obviously there'll be a limit where it stops. So we're gonna render out one of these images. There it goes, not yet. <laughs> 25, 20. Let's open up Nuke. The Clown Pass is basically going to let you adjust stuff afterwards. If you work at a studio where they're doing a lot of rendering, um, they don't just go into it, figure out the rendering, and then just send it off. Um, they do, I don't know why I took the mech arm. Clown Pass. They'll do a bunch of different passes. This is the clown pass. So basically, let's say they rendered out all their stuff and they're like, oh, that metal on there, we need to be a little bit lighter. This allows them to say, I want to grab everything that's this exact color and make it darker. So the clown pass from ZBrush or from T-Shot uh, will render out and give us one of those passes. So let's see, this is at 11%. You can see how much cleaner this is looking too. Um, now that we're letting it go through and actually render out a full frame. Um, these renderings will take some time to do. You may have to come in and set it up like on a Friday or Saturday just so that it has all day Saturday and all day Sunday and part of Monday to work. Um, other stuff to pay attention to, look at the back of this arm here. Like let's say I go through and I spend um, three days rendering this and I'm like, ooh, that's kind of chunky. Uh, I don't like how that's kind of like blocky like that. I go back to Maya, I click on it. 
And I'm like, well, I guess it's smoothed here, like that's the rough version, but it's still not smoothed enough. I would go through and actually smooth it out. And then I would save my stuff. And then when I go back into Keyshot, um, this is still thinking. You can import, and it'll actually let you update your geometry. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, all right, so that's looking pretty good. I should have lowered my settings just so we can see this faster. Let's go here to options. I guess we'll leave it. Might be right. Let's go 64. All right, so I lowered my samples. That way we can get a quicker view of this. Um, you'll see this is with three samples. This is with four samples. Again, the more samples you have, it's basically taking all these bits of grain and just refining it more and refining it more and refining it more until it's nice and smooth across the entire thing. You may still hit a spot where that smoothness doesn't work out. Uh, whatever settings you have aren't there. And then on your material itself, there's typically samples right there. So if I did my metal or my ground, let's double click that. Okay, that one doesn't have any, of course. Oh, there it is. Uh, if I click my ground and it's still not smooth like I want it, I can crank the samples up just on that ground and that way the ground will be smoother um, and I don't have to worry about the other stuff. All right, so this is 30 samples, 31. What did I put this to? 64. And if you look at this, you can see, like, if I get to 40 and this looks nice and smooth, there's no reason for me to go further than that. Um, but this still is kind of blocky. I can see some stuff in here. But I think that's rendering out pretty nicely. It's 54, 55. <laughs> Show that. Uh, while we're waiting for that, here's some stuff that's uh, in Keyshot 8 that is new. Um, anytime we render stuff, we're trying to make things look more realistic. So one of the things you can add is this kind of um, graininess that would happen on top of it. Like if you had um, speckles or something that would be on your surface, you can do that. Um, they also have this other thing, which is uh, bubbles. So if you had a piece of, um, we use this duck here as their example. Um, this is like a uh, rubber or a, a, a mold that was poured and it has these little bubbles that are like stuck inside it, like it didn't fully set. Um, so they have these like little bubbles that are like trapped under the surface. And then here's those speckles again added to that thing. So again, some cool stuff. And they also have displacement, which is a new thing that they've added to the latest version of that. 64 samples, 100% done, cool. So now let's go into Nuke and let's open that up. We have 20 mech arm images. Well, it's winter, I'm like, well, that's not bad. We have 20 mech arm images. It puts them all as separate files, which is kind of annoying. I don't think there's a spot for that to change that output. Oh, I didn't click that. Um, oh, I should refresh. Yep. Nope, maybe it is not. I'll have to verify that. There should have been a spot for us to do that. Okay. So this is our stuff. And those of you signing up for Nuke next semester, this is a lot of the stuff that we'll be going through also. Um, so here's our ambient occlusion. So black and white pass, just like we had before. Uh, we could just take these two and then merge them together and then set that to multiply. And so now if we look at the before and after, you can see it adds just that extra bit of contact shadow to it, making it again, just have a little bit more depth um, here is our depth channel. So you can see all the depth information is there. Uh, the back did not show up. It's like completely gone. Um, so we'd have to fix that. There's the clown pass. 
So you'll see all those materials, the, um, the red, the blue here, and the yellow, each one of these is a separate uh, material or a separate clown pass that I could then adjust. So just as a, for instance, let's go and shuffle the red out of this. So I'm going to go to ramp and clamp, clamp. Okay. So here is just the red channel. Okay. Now there is some red inside here. Um, so that's pulling it out too. All right. Let's use a different one and not that one. Let's use copy, I guess that. So I'm going to move my mouse over this right there. Okay, so I'm going to move this right here. This is what I'm going to key. Where's that red? Okay, so now I should have all that red there. I'm going to uh, invert it. There we go. Okay, so if you look at this, there's just the red I've isolated. And then now I can do something like this is what it looks like. Let's say I go and add a grade node to this <clears throat> and I darken the whole thing. Oops, I have to look at it, there we go. So the whole thing is really dark. I can use this mask on the keyer and that way it's just darkening those red zones. Or it's just brightening those red zones. Or I click on this and I can maybe give those a little bit of a tint to it. Maybe I want to have a little more contrast, so I have this kind of cool and warmness happening here. So it's a little bit of a blue tint mixed with the red. Now, this is based on the entire thing. At studios, they would actually go through and they would break off the pieces. So like all, like that would be a separate rendering and it would have all of its passes. This uh, metal part here would have all of its passes. The black parts would have all of their passes. And it would basically have this huge structure. Imagine a car, all the sheet metals on one layer, all the um, glasses on another layer, all the plastics are on another layer, all the chrome. And then they do all of this stuff to each one of those layers to get it so that this red or silver or whatever is the exact color that GM or Chrysler or whoever wants. Now, once you have it set up once, it's very easy to just populate it. As long as you have that process going, uh, it works. And you can see here all these other passes that I've rendered out. These are all different passes that uh, we're able to extract our stuff from and utilize to control whatever it is we're trying to do with this. Um, this is our diffuse pass. So basically, like, that's just color, okay? Everything else, like this glass here, that's coming from refraction. Did I render that one? There's reflection. There's refraction. There we go. So there's refraction. All of this is reflection. If I were to put these together, so I just merge diffuse and reflection together and I say plus, it gives me that. So it's a subtle change. There it is before, there it is after. And then if I were to merge this into that as well and set that to be a plus, You can see how I'm not there yet, but I'm getting closer to getting back to that original image. And then what else do we have here? We have our shadow. Let's merge this into here <clears throat> and set this to multiply. All right, so there it is, a bit closer. Okay, but now with all these things separated, here's all my glass, right? That's all that stuff. So if I wanted to add a grade node to this and change the color of just the glass, as long as I'm looking at it, there we go, um, I should be able to adjust that. And there he is. He's not pulling anything out of that one. Let's go here. So that's not, the grade isn't doing a whole lot for this one. Let's do a hue correct or a hue shift. Let's do that one. And hue rotation. There we go. And now I can add a grade node to this, maybe multiply it up a little bit. 
Now you'll see that there's some things that it just doesn't do right out of the box like this. As I change this color here, you'll notice that there's still red on this because the reflection still has bits of red in it. And as I go down here, this reflection is also red. So this is where it gets trickier because as you start to want to customize this more, you have to be able to go through and do all of that. Even on my clown pass here, it doesn't have all of those features. So I can do minimal adjustments on there, but it really comes down to being able to break apart every single piece so that as I adjust the reflections on the metal, I can adjust that red so now it's green. And the same thing on the floor, as this is red, I now want that to be green, okay? So uh, that's good. So I would do my animation, I would click on my frame output, I would make sure that this is set to entire duration, render it out, you don't have to do the passes, but render it out, put it in After Effects and make a movie. And then for your still image, uh, we have to then go back to turn this off. Back to our image here, I have to open this up, reset this to, um, I, if I set it to 3000, it does that, it's like huge. Uh, it still won't fit on my screen. So what I do is I just shrink it. So I go 600 and unlock it and go 480. Let me shrink it again. There we go. Oops, wrong screen. Come on. There we go. So I type 600 by 480. That's basically like 20% of 3000 by 2400. Um, so now when I do my still image, this is where you can get a little bit more creative with some of the stuff because we don't have to worry about the animation of it. Uh, I'm going to unpause my real-time rendering and kind of move this in. I can go to my um, camera. Maybe I'll add depth of field here. Select my focus point. Let me get closer. Maybe I'll even change my perspective focal length to like 120 or something. At some point, your machine might start really slowing down. So you may want to go back up to lighting and turn off some of these other things or turn it back to basic. So I'll turn depth of field back on. I'll click on a piece. I'll set the f-stop up higher. There we go. And you'll be surprised at just what a little bit of uh, depth of field can do for this. There we go. So we'll play it down on there. And then when I do this one, uh, I would just go to my render settings, go to still image, set up my still image, make sure it's 3000 by 2400. and then do my render here. And again, you still have those same samples per setting that you'd want to also set up. Cool. Okay, so by the time you're done with this, you should have an animation of your arm, uh, and then you should have a still image of your arm that you're going to utilize for this scene. Um, you'll see my Maya is actually going like really kind of glitchy now because I'm kind of using this real-time renderer in the background. Um, it's just part of working with it. Just shut stuff down, reboot your system if you need to. Um, if you have a new HDR you want to use, you can import different HDRs in here. Um, let's upload, export, where's my import? There, add. New folder, there it is, import. So you can find an HDR and load your HDR into that, make a new HDR, whatever. Like I said, it's pretty amazing what you can do uh, with the software. Cool. All right, so that should take you through the end of this assignment.
questions on it?